There we go. The gospel of Jesus Christ has not changed, but some have perverted God's good news into bad news. I'm Pastor Larson, visitation pastor, and happy to be back visiting again for Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. This is our Bible study, which we hold on a Zoom on a Saturday morning, and uh, you can watch it anytime. We invite you to our worship services at 8.30 and 10.30. More and more people are coming in person, but you can still watch it online. Okay, and as uh, you know, it is broadcast through YouTube on Sundays at 9.30. You can find it by looking up Pastor Larson's Bible study. Now, it doesn't belong to me, but I am called to conduct it. And we also have a Thursday morning Bible study. Uh, the Bible study at Thursday morning, Pastor, is canceled for the summer. I didn't know it was already canceled. Thank you for that change. Yes. We're located at 400 North Swinton. That's at the corner of Lake Ida and Swinton. And you can find it easily when you're in Delray Beach, Florida. Welcome to our church. We're going to jump into Paul's letter to the Galatians. It has six chapters, and there's a lot of detail, historical and biographical and theological. It is uh, dense in, uh, in the number of theological ideas uh, per square inch. <laughs> so what we're doing, and I promise you only an introduction we are not going to do a verse by verse study that would take us far too deep uh, and take a long, long time. So that's where we're calling it an introduction. So I'm going to ask this rhetorical question. I said rhetorical question, just for you to think about. How would you answer this? A pastor or teacher, what if a pastor or teacher had misled the people by adding law requirements to the gospel? And what if that pastor or teacher was distorting the free grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if you were in the hearing of that pastor or teacher, what would you do? How would you react? I'm not asking for an answer right now, but think about it. It's a serious thing. It's a very serious thing. And that is the chief article of our study of Galatians. When false teaching disturbs you, well, are you saved by the gospel or by the gospel plus the law? You see the word plus in all caps? That's necessary to emphasize the difference between the gospel alone and the gospel plus the law. When a congregation, or let's say a group of congregations, is misled by this kind of gospel plus law teaching, spiritual lives are endangered. You um, might agree with that or not, but I'm telling you that it can be very dangerous to your personal faith. So then you would ask me the question, Pastor, why is gospel plus law teaching dangerous? I'm saying to you on the basis of this letter of St. Paul to the Galatians that gospel plus law teaching must be rebuked. Now, what does rebuke mean? I don't use that every day. I don't think you do either. So we'd better define it. What is rebuke? To correct. To correct. Is there a harsh tone inferred in rebuke? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ian, um, I'm supposed, I, I suppose that occasionally your parents or your teachers correct you. Uh, you might have trouble getting the, the tense of a verb right or the number of a verb and use a plural verb with a singular no, uh, noun or pronoun. And that's a correction. 
But if you do something wrong against the rules of the household or the classroom, you might be called <laughs> on uh, your parent or your teachers. They might rebuke you. Yeah. And how does that feel when you're rebuked? It, it, it feels better not to be rebuked, that's for sure. It, it makes you feel what? Uh, it kind of uncomfortable. Yes, yes, yeah, and and guilt and right. or shame might come in if it you're. Can be a, yeah, it can be a physical rebuking and and a and a yeah. physical rebuking sometimes. A physical <laughs> rebuking. Along with it. <laughs> no, that's the punishment. Okay. Also, a reaction is um, anger at the person rebuking you. Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes you want to. <laughs> You want to respond in kind, and that's not too good if someone is over you in authority. Mm -hmm. But if a teacher adds the law to the gospel, that teacher should be rebuked. Mm -hmm. And you understand why we're using that word. Paul's letter to the Galatians gives us an example of how the Lord used the Apostle Paul to rebuke the false gospel plus law teaching that had disturbed a Christian congregation in Galatia. And that answers our question, why study Galatians? It still doesn't seem to apply to us because I suppose that if I said, well, have you, do you remember going anywhere where it was gospel plus law? Just think about that. I'm not asking for a definite answer here, but you might have experienced that. And I mean gospel plus law in order to be saved. I'm not talking about the use of the law as a guide, which we study occasionally and would study in the fifth and sixth chapters of Galatians. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, all right? We're studying Galatians because it gives us this, an ex this example of how a good teacher named Paul rebuked the false teachers that he was encountering in Galatians. in Galatians, right, and in the book of Acts. That false gospel plus law teaching can still disturb Christian congregations today, and it can disturb individual Christians, believers, when they, not their teacher, not their pastor, or preacher, when the individual Christian adds law requirements to the gospel that he or she believes. Now, that's a wrinkle that you didn't expect. Sometimes the receiver of a message adds something to it, uh, intentionally or by habit, uh, partially by the way they were brought up. We have a lot of law in our conscience. We had a, have a lot of law in our memories. And if we were raised by strict parents, I'm gonna say overly strict, I don't know you, then you might have a little bit of this lingering around the, the, the edges of your brain, huh? Okay, and I hope not, because you know that we are saved by the gospel alone. So before we get any further, I think you might be wondering if you didn't know already, as we introduce this letter of Paul to the Galatians, well, where in the world is Galatia? Well, strictly speaking, that region, that province, as it was called, the province of Galatia, that doesn't exist anymore. Where is Galatia? Anybody want to guess? You know? Oh. Is it where like um, um, is it where like Croatia and Macedonia and those places were? You're a little bit too far west. Too far west. Okay. Or Turkey. Well, no, Turkey. I, uh, Turkey. Yes. Oh, oh, that's still. I'm still too far west. Oh, okay. Turkey. Yeah. Um. Uh, <laughs> these days, when I ask a, a question like that, 
I, I picture people jumping to their iPhone or their computer <laughs> and, and looking at in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, because the way I was taught in engineering school, it wasn't knowing everything, it's knowing where to find it. And that is so much more true today because you can't know everything. Oh, it was up near. Uh, there you go. Up near Damascus, northern north of Galilee, up there. All right, Jerusalem is down here, right? Mm -hmm. Judea. Yeah. We're going to get a better map in a little bit. But Galatia is a region or a province in part of what is now. This is all Turkey today. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, here are some cities. Oh, pardon? Way around there. Okay. Okay. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Russia is up here to the north. We'll have a better map later, but I wanted to have you see that Galatia is is rather uh, long from north to south, but most of Saint Paul's work in setting up churches in the southern cities um, was all of his work was in the in the south okay oh now here's a map of turkey and if i go backwards like this you see turkey and yeah. now now you get where turkey is today and these cities that we're talking about um you saw tarsus here right mm -hmm. well that's still there but the other cities have been either renamed or they're in, they don't exist anymore. Mm. You see, okay. you don't see those names. And the borders up on the back sea, yeah. So mm -hmm. those those cities that he, in which he settled uh, new churches were in, in That's central right. southern Turkey, right in, mm -hmm. in here, and you see um, how close it is to the difficulties in the Middle East today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to speak politically, but I think you have heard of the administration of the country of Turkey has wavered a little bit, is not as always pro-Western as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One time the Air Force had uh, bases in Izmir, and I don't remember the other city but I don't know if we still do that. But that's not pertinent to our study. Someone have a comment. I was just going to say, I know, I'm not going to, it's, it's, it's a political statement for today's politics, so no. Okay. About the new leader. It is, um, it is a, an area which has gone back and forth over the centuries. And um, of course, if you grew up in the 50s, you remember the humorous song, Absolutely. it's not Constantinople, it's Istanbul. You yeah. can't go back to Constantinople. <laughs> and, and then the rhetorical question is ask, asked, why it's nobody's business but the Turks? <laughs> uh, if you don't remember that song, you are, uh, you're just fine. Um, <laughs> These, too young. <laughs> these memories linger on and they have absolutely have no use today. Okay. I've been lucky enough to visit three places in Turkey. Istanbul, was which was like a dream visit. And of course, Ephesus, a lot of, and then also Anatolia. Oh, Anatolia. Oh, that's down on the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, the Mediterranean. It's, Ephesus is also. Yeah, yeah, this is Ephesus here. It's been renamed. Is Mark? Oh, okay. Yeah. I believe that's true because uh, Ephesus had a, a natural uh, bay, and uh, oh, people yeah, it was on the it was on the shoreline, be, and, but it isn't now. It's four miles in. It was, but in the old days, it was a seaport. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that in ancient days, before we had rail and other forms of transportation of uh, mass transportation, people established their cities near bodies of water. If it wasn't a river or a sea, it was some natural port because everything was done, uh, not everything, but a, a, a large portion of the shipping uh, went by ship. Okay, enough of 
You know, geography is a fascinating subject, and most of us do not study it after we leave high school, except as we travel. Pastor, yes, I'm taking world geography at Palm Beach State this summer. <laughs> I remember oh, you saying that, and yeah. you're going to get some information that will probably help us in our Bible studies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I had been there to know this stuff. I knew where that was. Okay. You are very fortunate to have visited that. Yeah. I don't think I would go today. Um, no. Yeah, I won't go today. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's study the book of Galatians. It was um, prior to mid-century. In 48 or 49, Paul was traveling with Barnabas through the cities of Antioch in Galatia, cities like Iconium, Lystra, some say Lystra, and Derby, And you can read about that first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, if you want to. And that will give you some background on the book of Galatia, a book of the uh, letter to the Galatians. Now here's our favorite map again with those cities that are mentioned in St. Paul's uh, travels. And you know that St. Paul was more a missionary than he was a pastor, but he had a pastoral heart and he really cared for his people. And later on, when he was away from them, he wrote to them, especially when he found out that they were in trouble, in trouble with not having enough to eat or doctrinally, when mm -hmm. someone was disturbing mm -hmm. their faith. And that is uh, why he wrote Galatians. Okay, that's the reason for the letter. Paul taught and preached the gospel. And as he did that, he appointed elders in each church that he visited. Now, an elder in the New Testament is about the same as a pastor. He teaches and preaches, and he takes care of the sick along with the other people in the congregation. And they make sure that the gospel is preached. So when you read about the elders in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and in Titus, and when you read the, the letter um, of Paul and the book of Acts, and you come across the name elder, it would be good if you think, oh, that's, that's the same as pastor. Understand? Okay. It's, it's an important teaching of the New Testament. But the word pastor, the, the word that means shepherd, is really not there in the Greek. The word behind the word elder in the New Testament is either presbyterus, which has been used in our day as the Presbyterians. They took that name from that form of government, church government, or it is Episcopus, which the Episcopal Church took as their uh, <laughs> form of government uh, to be used in, in that denomination. But the word Episcopus means overseer, okay? Overseer, Episcopus. So when you read the word elder, it's one of those two words in the Greek, and you have to look it up to find out which one it is and what nature of church uh, service is being pointed to. I wish they would just transliterate it and put uh, presbyterus there, but I guess that wouldn't go, go down easily. Okay, so Paul set up elders in each one of the congregations, and then he left them in charge. First, he taught them. He taught them how to teach and what to teach, and then he went on. That's what a missionary does. Today, a missionary might stay in an area for five, six, seven years because the language difficulties and the cultural difficulties, there's a big bridge to, to cross over. Well, that's another subject. You know my tangents. That's what Paul did. And this is how the congregations were established in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the other teachings of the New Testament. It is difficult for us to know what books, if any, they had in their possession. Mm. Occasionally they're quoted by Paul, 
but I don't recall reading, correct me if you know, about any parchments that the congregations themselves had. We didn't have the Xerox copier uh, present, and we had people who did nothing but sit and copy in a legal way books uh, from a, an original or from another copy and make one for others. But I don't have archaeological evidence in front of me to tell you what they had. But they did have a memory. And from that memory, they taught what they had been taught. That's what the elders were busy doing. OK. To the churches in Galatia, well, they were being taught and established, but there's a big however, which is the reason for our studying this letter. Over the 20 centuries of church history, many yeah. false teachers have gone out into the world. It's not quite time to make it 21 centuries. That would happen Oh, actually, that's not far away. Another 10 years, I think we could say 21st, 21 centuries. Well, many false teachers have gone out into the world, and Jesus predicted it, didn't he? You remember what he predicted? Oh, you will hear many false teachers. Oh, why don't you uh, read that, Chris? Okay. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. And the I fruits guess, are yeah. the content of their teaching and those that they bring into their false teaching with them. Hmm. I, I have a, a like a, our study Bible has a page with which I think I talked to you about this once before with false prophets. Mm -hmm. It um, even though we um, don't think about this actually because our television uh, preachers have become dear to a lot of people and I know some who 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 when I looked at this list I was shocked. Uh, well, I wasn't shocked, really, but I mean, it was there in the, in our study Bible, and um, I think I mentioned it to one girl who I can talk to pretty um, quickly about one of her earlier teachers, and um, and then I know someone else, so it's shocking that, and I'm not going to say the names, you can look it up in the Bible, I forget what, what book it's in, or where it is. It would be a long study. You would be at it for months. No, it, it, it's just the page with, with no. current people on it. Oh, uh, Chris, I'm talking about if you looked up the general subject of false teachers in the church over oh. the last 20 centuries, there would be books written about the, the <laughs> number of teachers and what they taught. Now, you have one page in that Bible that you're pointing to, but I mean, it's a it's an ugly subject which has troubled the church from its beginning. I, I also want to say at this time that uh, what happens, what happened in the church in the first century, it was not all pretty and nice and neat. We have a false conception of the first mm -hmm. century if we think, oh, pastor, I'd like to go back to the way it was in the first century when we didn't have all these arguments and disputes over doctrine. Well, <laughs> read the New Testament and see how many things went wrong because sin was still in the world as it is today and people distorted what they had been taught for various reasons. Sometimes for money, sometimes for personal glory, sometimes they had been misled and they continued to mislead others because they were sincere in their false teaching. And no one had rebuked them or they had not listened to rebuke. This is going to go on until Jesus comes again. 
All right, so you beware of false prophets. There are other uh, predictions of Jesus in the Gospels about false prophets, but we won't look them all up now, okay? So the question is a pretty obvious question. Maybe we've answered it already. Why does Jesus send us this warning? Well, we have a, a subject verb uh, contradict uh, problem here, don't we? Well, <laughs> pastors aren't perfect either. So Ian, why don't you rebuke me for have this? <laughs> you know better, don't you? Why does Jesus send us? I can't correct it on the fly, not easily. Answer the question, don't look at the grammar. <laughs> we don't go on the wrong path All right i was going to say we have pretty short memories and we seem to uh you know want like a uh, christian said wander off uh, back to our sinful ways and sinful nature many times there's a, a comfort in those areas that are not good for us okay and jesus knows the future doesn't he he knows the problems that come because of sin Sometimes it's the sin of pride, the, the, the thirst for power and glory that sends a false teacher. I, I could add money, mm. and I don't want you to go off on that television tangent uh, too far, because uh, <laughs> I know who, uh, the kind of people I'm thinking about, and we've seen examples in the past several decades. We don't need to mention their names. We just need to be aware that unless we stick to what ha the Holy Spirit has taught in the Word of God, we can be drawn into those false teachings without knowing it. That's what happens when people who are not taught well are not able to filter out the false doctrine. I don't want to make too much of this, but I don't want to make too little of it either. You understand? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we can't, we pastors cannot superintend every soul that comes under our view. Right. We can only do it. And this is what a sentence that I learned well is that the best refutation of false doctrine is to teach the true doctrine all right i'm going to leave it at that but we are warned there is a one way of showing the cross of jesus christ on which the prince of glory died he did that voluntarily he did that for us to take away sin that troubles us and the sin, unfortunately, that doesn't trouble us, but should trouble us. He did that not to ruin our consciences, but to bring forgiveness to guilty consciences and motivate us to avoid the sin and do the right thing. And we do the right thing not in order to gain his favor, because in Christ we have the Lord's favor. There is the gospel, and it has been symbolized by the cross all these centuries. Right. We can, we can love the hymns, in the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time. We can, we can glorify the cross so much that it becomes the, the central symbol of Christianity throughout the world. Uh, I'm not, I can't make too much of it. It's impossible to make too much of the cross. Read the New Testament and see how many times it is mentioned, especially by Paul. But one of the most damaging errors that can be forced upon the church is the one that destroys the bedrock teaching of salvation. And you know the bedrock teaching of salvation, don't
don't you? Possible. By grace alone, alone. By through faith, faith alone, alone, and in Christ alone. Sola gratia, sola fides, sola Christus. Well, I left out one. I left out the source. Scripture alone. But I left it out because the bedrock of salvation is the is the compilation of these three by grace through faith in Christ. I know you know that, but I don't want you to ever forget it. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone is my salvation and yours. If people believe their salvation comes outside of the one means which God has given, then they do not believe the gospel. They might know the gospel. They might know the cross of Jesus on which the Prince of Glory died. But if they add something to it, then they don't have the gospel anymore. And you're going to see what this is in the letter to the Galatians. And I really urge you to read the whole letter. Even if you don't understand everything that you read, uh, take the cafeteria. No, no, that's the wrong, uh, the wrong metaphor. Take this idea that you will receive from the letter whatever your mind and heart can receive at the present time. And the parts that you don't understand, well, we can look those up or get some help or say, well, I don't receive it today. I'll receive it perhaps in another day. Get what you can get from this wonderful letter. It's an exciting letter. It's a letter filled with anger. Paul is angry. Well, we're going to get into that, why he's angry. The false gospel preacher must be rebuked. There's that word again. He must be rebuked. It's not, well, he's a nice guy. <laughs> mm. No, 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 no. He's not a nice guy if he is troubling the church with the law plus, I mean, the gospel plus law teaching. You have any comments? <clears throat> Why can't more people see this? Because of <laughs> sin that dwells within each one of us whether we're teacher or receiver. I, I know that's a quick um, answer, but it really is the seed of the, the problem is in us, in, in the teacher himself. Well, I mean, is it because they're taught that? Because I know very good people that just no. don't see that. Yes. Here's a sentence that I learned. Uh, the seminary is the seedbed of the church. The seminaries are the seedbeds of the church. What is sown into the minds and hearts of those who are studying to become pastors? Mm -hmm. And we could include teachers in that as well. That is sown in the hearts and believed because, and this is a real, it's a sociological thing not a theological thing or it's in part in part of it is the, uh, sociological and that is when you sit at the foot of a good teacher who is knowledgeable and thorough and goes into the original and does the history and the application artfully you learn to love that teacher and to believe that teacher and if that teacher is also in one respect or another, a false teacher, you receive it as true. Yeah. And you take it with you when you go to the church that God has called you to serve. And yeah. guess what you're going to sow? You're going to sow what has been sown in you. Yeah. You're going to repeat the air. So we are very careful in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, to put as our professors of theology in our seminaries, only those who subscribe to what is true. 
And you know, Pastor, what you just said was the conclusion I came to about those people. It, they were taught it, so. I didn't get your comment very clearly. It was broken up by. Um, what you just said was the conclusion I came to to help me understand the, the disparity I see. All right. They only can teach what they've been taught. Some <laughs> pick up false teaching from what they read or what they hear or what in concert with other pastors they learn at a um, at a seminar of some type. Hmm. We have we have to be oh, well. There's the Air Force slogan uh, that is eternal. The price of uh, peace is eternal vigilance. Full of those this morning, aren't I? <laughs> well, here's the point: by adding anything to the gospel, a false gospel teacher changes what God has done into what I do for God. What God has done, the teacher changes into what I do for God. That's the principal error that is uncovered in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Pastor Larson, yes. um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you already answered this, but does greed, um, does greed have anything to do with being a false gospel teacher? Does what? Greed. 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 A greed can be a motivation. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a pastor wants to do well, he might say, I can do this by teaching what the people want to hear. Mm. That could be. That's in, in, uh, in Paul's letter to, uh, I believe it's the first letter of Paul to Timothy. People will have itching ears, seeking teachers who tell them they, what they want to hear. Itching ears. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. And in, in, in out of greed, they might decide, you know what, if, if they like me enough, they'll give me a promotion or they'll give me an increase in salary. On the contrary, if I preach against their sin, they might decide to get rid of me. Yeah. If I add law, see, it's the natural tendency of all people, all people to want to do something, to receive something. It's our commerce instinct. I must mm -hmm. pay in order to receive. Well, that's true of everything except the gospel, because Jesus has paid that we might receive. So we have this, this awful thing within us that says it can't be free. Heaven cannot be a free gift. Well, it is. That's what grace means. So you are correct that, that greed could be a motivation to teach what God has done, plus what I do for God. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and this is not the first time you've heard that. It was in a sermon about three or oh, maybe five weeks ago now. The false gospel teacher changes the gospel of forgiveness through the work of Christ into something I must do for Christ. And if it doesn't change it, it merely adds what I do for Christ to what he has done. And that's that law addition to the gospel which destroys the gospel, gospel plus law, or gospel plus works. And here, I'm talking about a total change. Right. So they both exist, not necessarily side by side, but two ways of distorting the gospel. I'm putting it here in in the stark contrast of a change but it can also be as i said earlier adding what i do for christ to what he has done for me and it'll also always be our our tendency to want to do that 
only the only one who knows our true motivation is God himself. And uh, we can't fool him. And maybe mm -hmm. you think I'm making too much of this, but examine yourself, examine your own faith and see if you do not have occasionally this tendency. Now, all of you are daily doing wonderful good works of love to others in your family and your friends and in the church and to the stranger. Uh, whether you do it because you are paid to do that as, a, as one of the caretakers of this world, as a nurse or something, or, or you did it as a, in the past before you retired, uh, you told people what good foods to eat and what to avoid as a nutritionist. You see, you did it because you that's how you made a living, but you also did it as unto Christ, right? What is that? Matthew 25 or 24, I guess. Such a gospel is no gospel at all. What's no gospel at all? Adding what I do for Christ to what he's done for me. That's not a gospel. <laughs> now, one of the things that Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, if anyone, even an angel, preaches another gospel other than the gospel that I preach to you, let him be anathema. Now, anathema is kind of a polite word for damned. I sometimes okay. wish they would translate it that way, but they don't. I guess that's a word that we don't use. <laughs> but if anyone, even an angel from heaven, would... And there is no other gospel. There isn't any. Not in all the religions of the world is there any gospel except in Christ alone. All the other religions of the world are religions of works. All right? You can go study that. It'll take you the rest of your life. If Christ did not die in my place to earn complete forgiveness, then for what purpose did he die? Did he just get rid of my worst sins and I have to kind of own up to the rest of them and I have to change? Yeah, you know, maybe you know, uh, churches where you have to clean up your life before you come to Christ. Well, how are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. How are you going to get rid of sin? You and anyone who adds anything, does there a comment there? You step right up if you want to say, uh, I should pause more often for you. Anyone who adds anything to the free grace of Christ makes that grace incomplete and not free. See, this is a real, a real contrast, not an imagined one. It's night and day, and in the night, there is no grace. That's the biblical metaphor. This is the main theme of Paul's letter to the Galatians. So here's an application. It's about time, Pastor. We had an application. And so you're traveling and you find yourself in a strange town and you get up in the morning and you're looking for a church at Sunday, so you pick one out of the yellow pages. <laughs> oh, we've done that and we've been sorry. Jeannie and I have traveled a lot, uh, I guess, uh, when we took a vacation that wasn't to relatives. <laughs> well, I used to say to Jeannie, how about this year we do a non-relative vacation? So we traveled and we picked one in the yellow pages because we couldn't find one that had the word Lutheran on them. Or we found a Lutheran one and it turned out to be a problem because we listened and we prayed and we sang and then comes the sermon. Are you ready for this? You listen carefully because you've been taught that you are the one to judge your teacher. Yes, you are the one, the only one. 
And the preacher mentions the cross of Jesus. That was nice. But he adds the requirement that you must keep the law in order to be saved. Oh, I think I'm leaving now before the offering. <laughs> How would you respond? I think the preacher mentions Jesus Christ, but that's the requirement. You must keep the law in order to be saved. Anybody? Um, isn't it um because the law kind of um ties into the to the god because like you're you have to have the gospel but then like to be like not worthy you also have to have the law because you're sinners you also have the have to have the law because the law shows the sin and the gospel right. is is this is your salvation right That's, so doesn't the doesn't the law still have to be in your life the law still must be preached but i would like to underline in order to be saved whoops in order to be saved you must keep the law in order to be saved you know and you spoke correctly that the law shows us our sin we need that and we need the law as a guide for our lives now and we have it um pastor you have told me to be polite or you were glad that i was polite one time so what would what, what did you do i was i was going to say you know i would i guess i would number one pray about it i suppose if you were really concerned about what you heard you could linger back as the people were filing out and speak to the preacher afterwards uh, in a gentle manner ask him you know why does he mention you know what purpose is jesus crossed and dying on the cross if if one still has to do meet certain other requirements you know i probably you know probably question that theology that once jesus died on the cross uh, mm -hmm. for our sins and, you know, was resurrected that by grace, through faith, through Christ, we are saved. And so was his, was his dying on the cross all in vain? Yes. Was it not enough? Uh, yeah. Was yeah. that not enough? Yeah. No, I, I think you have a, a very good response there. And you do it in kindness and in love. You don't do it to attack. Yeah. Rebuking can be done in a gentle tone. Mm -hmm. a, a rebuke doesn't have to be a shout. You don't have to use your fist. <laughs> no. In fact, it would be far more effective. And since mm -hmm. you're passing through, you're not going to be there on Monday morning. <laughs> you're going to see if you can get 400 miles uh, down the pike um, for okay. the next stop. That's the way we do it. <laughs> Uh, and it's already noon and you got to get something to eat. I, I, we've been through this and we're not going to make 400 miles by four o'clock. No way. Uh, but my, my, you make a good response and some of us might do nothing at all and just leave with a kind of a sadness in our heart. And that, that's true too. So, But the prayer for the person to receive the truth from the books of the Bible would be excellent. Mm -hmm. We should pray for the congregation where God has made us to, to sit and learn and to serve. Mm -hmm. And we should pray for the pastors that they might be well taught so that, you remember my prayer, teach me Lord that I might be teachers of others. Well, I think our board of elders and who we choose is also very, very important because they're kind of responsible for helping to guide the pastor or, or I don't want to say oversee, but they do somewhat oversee also what is, you know, are, are we following the doctrine the church believes in is is what we believe in as um, as a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, being 
preached, I guess. Uh, you know, it's the Bible being preached. And, and that's right. They're also supposed to have that responsibility uh, as well as the congregation. All right. And if you have a concern that uh, the pastor wouldn't listen to, that would be your next step. But I hope you never, ever in your life have to go that far. Okay. But this is how the church goes on and keeps uh, in the one true faith. Okay. So I think you can see how necessary Paul's letter to the Galatians is and how, how current is it is uh, in our day and age, especially with television and the internet. The internet is so full of false things that it's, a, it's amazing. The things that you would only find in books are now preached on YouTube. Hmm. And and some of them are very entertaining. Well, and and some and some things in trying to get the truth through are being blocked, unfortunately. When, yeah, when, truth, when truth is when truth is is trying to be uh, said, it is regardless of relating to scripture or other things in our world are are being blocked. So that also becomes a, a problem. Many times we might have to. Uh, meet somebody face on face uh, in order to uh, get our uh, feelings or not our feelings, but, you know, express ourselves to get truth. Uh, to get mm -hmm. truth, you know, yeah. uh, I guess get it justified the statement justified or to sit down with the individual and uh, really talk to them. It goes back to having to interact with people, people to people. That's yeah. right. And it takes a little bit more effort than many people are willing to do. Yeah. And I have to ask this question before we get to the end of our hour. I failed to start the timer, but I think it was almost quarter after when we started. Anybody remember? I think that's right. Yeah, 10 after and quarter after, so. It was in that area, okay. Mm -hmm. So let me take just a few more minutes to answer the question. I think we're going to back up to this question next time. Who were the Judaizers? You're going to run across that term several times in our study. There's the Old Testament law, and it has three parts, the moral, the civil, and the ceremonial. The moral law is still in effect the Ten Commandments, and the New Testament applications. I'm not going into detail. I just want to outline Old Testament law, moral law, the legal law, which we would call the civil or judicial or the government law, the things that pertain to things like if you kill a chicken, then you may make restitution by giving the person uh, I, I don't remember what it was, th three more chickens. But it was, it was required in order to have justice. Oh, I think we ought to study that word justice someday, but I'm not up to it right now. I'm just <laughs> not up to it right now. But you know that there were legal requirements that were designed to take care of the civic, of the city, the people, the population and there was the ceremonial part of the law and these were the customs the things pertaining to the priests we studied some of them in first samuel the sacrifices that were made the dietary laws there were many things that were ceremonial and what i must say about the ceremonial part of the law is that many of them were pointers they were predictions, they were prophecies in action, and they pointed to Christ. The easiest one to talk about in the ceremonial law, which we no longer keep, is the day of what? Atonement. atonement. The day of atonement pointed to the atonement which would come when Christ, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed on the cross for the sins of the people. We no longer bring a lamb to church, a perfect spotless lamb to church in order to have the pastor sacrifice the lamb on the altar. We don't do that anymore. That was part of the ceremonial law. 
and it has been fulfilled completely in Christ. So we don't do that. The legal parts have been written into many of our judicial codes as part of the law that, that governs us, whether we like it or not. And the moral law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, those have been written into our civil law today, although so many of them have been blurred or distorted or removed that you wonder how long we can keep a moral society in a, in a world that denies there is any moral law and throws off all the restraints. I'm not going to make uh, you know very well how many parts of the moral law of God have been removed by order of judges and legislators and simply by ignoring what is still there on the books. And we can't change that by any force that uh, is known to man. I suppose that the iconoclasts or those who destroy without intending to rebuild um, I believe that you should do away with the present and then uh, the, the new will arise well that's been tried many times before and it just doesn't work what arises is a lawless society so here we have the Old Testament law and the people were called Judaizers to answer my question now, because they insisted on observance of all the ceremonial laws and customs of the Jews. Circumcision and dietary laws and Levitical laws that had been laid down in the Old Testament, but which had been fulfilled in Christ. So now instead of having the priests, we have the priesthood of all believers. We have pastors who have been chosen out of our midst in order to teach because they have been taught, but they are part of the congregation. Okay, they aren't like priests of the Old Testament. So this is as far as we have time to consider this today, but I want you to remember they were called Judaizers because they were insisted on this observance and when they came to the galatian christians in those congregations of galatia they said it is beautiful that you believe the gospel but we must also insist that you keep these laws hmm. and that was the main problem in galatia to which the letter of Paul addressed addressed them in uh, in in the fiercest of tones. Now, I I hope you will read the book book of Galatians, and it would be good if you read a couple of chapters this week, so that when we talk about the outline, you will see how that outline is being fulfilled. That's the next thing we're going to take up, okay? And I pray, I pray this with us now. Lord God, you have brought the gospel of Jesus to our hearts. And because of the work of the Holy Spirit, we have latched on to that gospel. It is ours. It has been brought to us by your grace and through the word that you inspired Lord God, please keep us in this one true faith and let us not waver even a hair's breadth from that which we have been taught from the scriptures. Teach us each day that we are sinners in need of your grace and that we are saved. Our sins are removed only by the blood of Christ and not by anything that we have done or could do. Thank you, Lord, for making our way clear and for 
bringing us with the clear light of the gospel to believe it and to hold on to it. May that be not only for us, but also for those whom we hold dear in our congregation and in our families. We love them and we want the best for them. And the best for them is Jesus. Through that same Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. And, and all